Except somebody's taking it out because it's been draining. Oh, yeah. And so I don't know if someone is. What's going on? Okay, that's good. Thank you.
Ciao, Fede. Hey folks, um, before we get started, I'd like to announce that there is a new class starting uh, as an alternative to this one. I think they call it uh, Young Adults. So, if you consider yourself a young adult, or if you're not a young adult, uh, and you would like to be in that class, uh, Joel will be teaching, he's on vacation, he will be teaching that class, is that correct, going forward, Charles, and in classroom number six? So if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, you won't hurt my feelings, you know, if you want to get up and go to that, because I know I'm a little bit different, right? So, but anyway, I understand, and, and a topic this quarter being Isaiah may be something that people, uh, but it's going to get better, uh, Isaiah, that's because we're going to get some really very interesting things. So just let you know that, if not this week, going forward, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I think Brian is teaching that class for Joel this morning. But it's called Young Adults. And if I weren't here doing this this morning, then that's where I'd be, being a young adult. Young at heart. But anyway, under, but just go where you can feel like you can learn the most and to be the most helpful for you going forward. But uh, appreciate uh, everyone here this morning. As you know, we're starting a new study. <clears throat> uh, this, you can call it Isaiah Part 2. As you know, we had Part 1. Uh, first 39 chapters, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a problem this morning. And the next uh, uh, section, uh, the last section of Isaiah will, will de deal with kind of a, a different emphasis. And so I think going forward also you'll see that there will be a lot of uh, messianic prophecies concerning Christ. And often you'll hear references made to Isaiah when someone's made saying a few words at the Lord's Supper or, or other issues. And so it's, it's a very important, I know it can be hard reading and kind of tough, and you read it and say, well, what does this mean? Well, that's a nice thing about this book is, is they have men who uh, are scholars, uh, who know the original language and have spent many years in, in preparing to help us understand. And, you know, with any topic, the, I think the most important thing is just to get the overall gist of it. How does the Old Testament and Old Testament teaching flow into the New? How does it help us understand the New? Do people who remember the Church of Christ believe in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Because if you began with no Old Testament and opened up Matthew chapter 1 and started reading it, you'll say, what in the world's going on here? What are they talking about? All these genealogies for Christ. What are they talking about? So, yes, we believe uh, the Old Testament, uh, and we believe that it's uh, preparatory for the coming of Christ. And as we study through uh, Isaiah more, you'll see that come forward. So if you don't have a book and you'd like to get one, uh, Brother Gary, anybody needs a book, raise your hand, and he'll bring one to you, right? Anyone need a book for? A couple you need a couple of batteries. A couple of batteries. Oh, a couple of batteries. I think he's going to get some for you, okay? He's going to get some for you. Are you having trouble with your... Okay. But you can be opening up to... Uh, before the table of contents, you'll see a thing called Isaiah Part 2. 
<clears throat> and this is uh, really important in setting the background for uh, the study of this next 13 weeks. Thank you, Gary. Ms. Bobby needed some batteries for her. Hey, Tom, uh, good to see you. Now, they have a new class called Young Adults. No. <laughs> Get right back here. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, in your book, if you'll open up to that section, it's called Isaiah Part 2. <clears throat> Usually, I don't like to read from lesson books, but this morning I may rely a little bit heavier on that uh, as we uh, work through this lesson, Isaiah Part 2. Okay, at the top of that page, uh, it says, Whereas uh, much of the emphasis of Isaiah part 1 was on the judgment of God. And we know from reading those chapters how God really came down on, the, uh, on Judah uh, and the activities they were involved in and where they were living. Their tendency toward idolatry uh, and idolatry practices. And they were trying to hold on to God, Jehovah, and idolatry practices. But he says the second part stresses the comfort of God based on Isaiah 41 through 2. Uh, and so it's, it's great to, uh, you know, sometimes we get chastised by bosses or by our parents or by our spouses. In my case, it's a spouse or maybe one of the members. And, and so we need, we need that. And so this is going to be, I think, somewhat more uplifting uh, as we uh, study this, and it says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she, uh, Judah, has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So they've been severely punished. Uh, they were under attack uh, by... Uh, uh, the Babylonians, uh, first it was the Assyrians. The Assyrians were more involved with the northern kingdom, Israel. But here we're talking about Judah. And later on it says here that, that Isaiah continued to point out the powers of the world and to warn Judah of their intent. Finally, he predicted of the Babylonian ca captivity. And we know that happened, and you've studied Daniel in the past, and we know what happened here, uh, that they were finally taken away into captivity there. And it remained there for 70 years. Later on, after that period of time, a remnant of, of people were allowed to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls that had been destroyed earlier in, in that warfare. And interesting enough, and I think one of the greatest proofs of the Bible, we look for these proofs, is this next statement here. It says, uh, predicted Babylonian captivity of these people and its deliverance. God would bring, he even predicted far in advance, and let me tell you, it was 150 years, approximately 150 years, the power of Cyrus in helping the captivities leave Babylon to return to their own land. And this is uh, mentioned, uh, uh, the captivity over there in 2 Kings 18 and what happened there with King Hezekiah. Remember King Hezekiah prayed to God that they would be spared uh, and ask for a repentance of the people and God did uh, spare them of any further uh, destruction of uh, Jerusalem. And so we find that it says there uh, that major prophecies of Christ are going to be coming up. Now we're studying from chapter 41 uh, here this morning but when we get to chapter 53 later on in some lessons we're going to read a very familiar, familiar references to the coming of Christ, the Messiah. So there's a lot of references and prophecies concerning the coming of Christ and how he would, would deliver the people. So, but to me it stands out that Isaiah can mention an individual that would come. It was going to be Cyrus. Remember Cyrus was a Persian uh, king. Uh, remember that the Assyrians were overthrown by Persia. And they ruled in that area. Now, where is Persia? Uh, it would be modern-day uh, uh, Iran. Uh, Babylon would be more like Iraq. 
And, they, and, and that would be the power. But it shows you that God uses sometimes people who weren't even Jews or people that were not people who believed in a one God. Uh, these, these kings, uh, powerful people, they wanted to say that, yes, there is a God, but there's also these idols that we worship, we look up to. So they wanted to cover all bases. But God used uh, King Cyrus, the Persian, some 150 years later after this chapter was written here, after, this, after these events, to uh, bring about uh, the return of the people from, Babyl from Babylon in captivity back to uh, Jerusalem uh, to the rebuilding of the wall. Any comment up to this point? I know uh, history is boring to some folks, but when we realize that the historical accuracy of the scripture, that it's not a bunch of fables and myths and, and a bunch of interesting stories made up, but there's actual historical proof that these things happen. And sure enough, uh, King Cyrus did allow the Jews to uh, return back to their homeland. Answering at the bottom of, uh, of the introductory page, it says, Attention is called again to the structure of Isaiah. It's 66 chapters break into two sections. Now get this, I didn't, I didn't know this, and I don't know. I thought chapters were, were divided or put in place by man. At least I know they are in the New Testament. Chapters 1 through 39 that we have finished studying and 40 through 66, this arrangement makes for 39 chapters in the first, just as the 39 books of the Old Testament. So, now get this. In the Old Testament, and the second part consists of 27 chapters consistent with the number of New Testament books. 27 New Testament books, 27 chapters. I never thought about that. I don't know if that's a, co a coincidence or it's just something that happened. But it's an interesting side fact uh, that how these things will tie in to events uh, in the New Testament. Okay, so now let's turn over to page one in your books, if you have a book. And uh, it will bring us to uh, Isaiah chapter 41. Uh, we're going to try to look at the first 24 verses. And I'll admit to you, when I read these 24 verses without the help of the book, I scratched my head and I said, what's he talking about here? And I can understand it. I mean, if we didn't have any help material here or the background, and we just read the first 24 verses of Isaiah 41, you say, boy, this is, I don't know what they're talking about here. I'm just going to move on. But hopefully this morning we can kind of look into it and, and see what the references are here mentioned in Isaiah 41. Uh, let's read the first uh, four verses in Isaiah 41 uh, from your Bibles here, and then we'll uh, solicit your comments. This is not a lecture class. Uh, it's a class, even though it's a little bit bigger in most classrooms. Please make any comments or questions. Any questions you have, I'll refer them to Joel, <laughs> and I'll get him for being gone today. So we've already been talking about it, and so uh, and he can maybe address those, or Charles. Now Charles will be the teacher here. Should be, I guess, next week. So at any rate, here we go. First four verses of Isaiah 41 says, "Keep silence before me, O coastlands." Now. I don't know, you know, have any idea what they're talking about, but what they're talking about here are the uh, Gentile peoples who occupy this coastal area, I guess from Tide and Sire all the way down the coastland of this eastern Mediterranean area uh, where uh, Israel ends there. And these were pagan people. Keep silence before me, O coastlands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak let us come near together for judgment. So there's going to be a coming of the minds here. He's putting forth here. Who raised up one from the east? Now this here is a reference to Cyrus. Cyrus in the Persian Empire would have been east of Palestine. Uh, and so he's referring to the east. It would be geographically uh, east of that area. Who in righteousness called him to his feet? Who gave nations before him? In other words... Cyrus and the Persian armies conquered uh, the Babylonians and made him rule over kings. Who gave them as a dust to his sword, as driven stubble to his bow? Who pursued them and passed safely by the way that he had not gone with his feet? Who has performed and done it? All these questions. Calling the generations from the beginning. I, he's going to answer his own question. I, the Lord, am the first. 
and with the last, I am he. God is the beginning, he's the, he's the end, he's the alpha, he is the omega. I know our minds can't grasp that, at least mine can't, how God has always been there and still exists and always will. We can sit there, no matter how high IQ you have, and try to figure that out. And I tell you, it's a, it's a difficult thing to contemplate. The majesty, the omniscience, the omnipresence of, of, of Almighty God, Jehovah. But God is involved in these processes. And this individual that he is referring to here in verse uh, 2 is Cyrus. And this would come about, as I mentioned before, 150 years later. And that's exactly what happened. How many of us can say what's going to happen 100 years from now, 50 years from now? Who knows what's going to happen really tomorrow? You ever think about that? I have. We think we got everything all laid out and everything all squared away. But things happen in our lives. We get these curveballs thrown at us and often we're just not really prepared for it. And I guess what it comes down to is our reaction to these issues in our lives. You know, how are you and I going to react to these situations? And so when we live a God-focused life uh, as Christians, it should help us get through these situations because... Things are going to happen, and sometimes things happen that are out of our control. There are things that we question why. You know, these, all these poor little children down there in Uvalde, Texas, that were killed, I mean, by some mentally ill maniac who went in there and just started shooting. I mean, who knew that day when they was going to go to school, their parents, or something like that was going to happen to their children? Imagine, try to imagine what's going through those families' minds and their hearts. It's got to be just terrible beyond belief, right? It's something we can't hardly contemplate, these terrible things. And not only there, other places. And, and it's, it seems like it's escalated. Uh, and I don't know all the psychology behind it. I don't know that I know any of the psychology behind it. But it's, it's a very complex issue. Uh, mental health, political, a lot of other things are involved. So... We really don't know, but the thing that God knows, He knew what was going to happen 150 years in the future. He revealed this to Isaiah. I'm not so sure Isaiah really grasped what was going on at this point. But he trusted God, he trusted what he told him, and he wrote it down. And so we find here, in the top of page one, uh, one that... Uh, God uh, has uh, sworn an oath, which he swore to their fathers. Uh, let's turn to Genesis 12, 2. Now, this is going to be old information for a lot of you. But another proof of God and his majesty is how God keeps his promises. Why is that important to you and I? Well, God has promised if you and I are faithful, obey the gospel, and remain faithful until death, he's promised us a home in heaven. This is a promise. How do we know that this is going to be fulfilled? How do we know that God is going to keep and not change his mind? Well, I think one of the answers to that is when we go back and we see that God selected a man named Abraham. He came from a remote area called Ur of Chaldees, which was in the, in the Mesopotamia area, of uh, which would now be uh, modern-day Iraq, if you call it modern, but anyway, Iraq. And so there, he chose an individual by the name of Abram, uh, became known as Abraham, and, took, and told him to get up with his family and move to a land that he would show him hundreds of miles away. He knew the kind of man he was dealing with with Abraham. Abraham was not a Jew. Was Abraham ever a Jew? That's a tough question. He's the father of the Jews, but he wasn't, he wasn't a Jew at that time. He was an individual from Ur of Chaldees that God had chosen. He knew he would be the kind of individual that he needed, and he would become the father of all nations. So when we go to Genesis chapter 12 and read a couple of verses there, <clears throat> first three verses, it says, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you, this is a promise, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. 
and you shall be blessing, a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse them who curse you. And in you, I get this very important, I had just underlined, if you underline your, in your Bible, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now talk about Jews here, we're talking about all families, through Abraham will be blessed. So how would families be blessed through Abraham? His descendants, the Jews, and eventually through them, the Christ would come on the scene. And if we follow up the events throughout the Old Testament, we come up to uh, the kings uh, through David. Uh, and if you read Matthew chapter 1, you'll see that genealogy there. But God made a promise. He said, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be the greatest. Your all families are going to be blessed through you. Uh, and all families are blessed. I mean, we're all blessed through God and through Jesus Christ. But there are some contingency there, aren't they? Is God, is God, does God bless all people? He does through Jesus Christ, does he not? But is there something that's involved there in that process? Do we, Jesus says there, and, and John, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Plenty of people talk about Jesus. Plenty of people say they pray to God. Plenty of people say they believe it. But are they keeping God's commandments? If they're not keeping the commandments, how can I say I love, let's say, a parent or, and I don't keep their commandments? I don't even try. I could care less what their thoughts are. I could care less what they believe or what they want is best for me. If you really love someone, then you are going to do your best to uh, keep their precepts. Uh, please. Yes. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, with Saul on the road to Damascus, you know, and Christ appeared to him. Many religious folks would tell you that Saul, who became Paul, was saved right then. But he was told, go and I'll show you, I mean, he'll be told you what you must do. And there are things you and I must do. Are we earning our own salvation through works? No, I mean, we have certain things that were taught that we must do uh, to obey Christ uh, and His blessings. But like a lot of folks, you know, they don't want to uh, accept that or, or believe that. If you turn to, uh, forward to Genesis chapter 15, and verse 4 there, still dealing with Abraham here. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So all the peoples of the earth will be descendants through Christ. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted to him for righteousness. To him it is said, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land and to inherit. So he keeps re-mentioning or re, you know, he keeps emphasizing that there's going to be a blessing. And we know that there was a blessing because the children were finally taken into uh, Egyptian captivity, whether or not, for hundreds of years. And that could have been the end of it. They could have remained there. But God had a plan, and when God makes a plan, it's going to happen, whether we like it or not. And, and it's, it's, going to, it's going to happen. Because, and so those children of Israel were delivered out of that captivity because he says, I'm going to give you a land. Uh, and he told Abraham there that he, would, he promised to him that where you live right now, Abraham, way before they, they went to conquer the lands many uh, centuries later, that your people will inherit this land. And sure enough, uh, they moved on uh, and they did go in and, and conquer that land 
uh, that we re that we read about uh, later on. And Bob's already read that about uh, that the Lord uh, is faith is faithful, and so you and I should take great comfort in that that God has promised us if we we do His will and keep His commandments, we're going to have a home with Him in heaven. Now, but it's our choice. We may say, well, I don't believe that. You know, I, I believe there's some God out there, but I don't believe I have to do what he says. You know, Jesus' blood upon the cross covered, covered all sins, and we're all forgiven, and so we just, you know, go on and live our own lives. But it's, but it's just not that way, is it, folks? Uh, it's, just, it's just not New Testament scriptures that would bear that out. But anyway, later on on that page one, it says, By the time uh, Isaiah's ministry, the nation was divided. Remember the northern kingdom, which is called Israel, and, and uh, was conquered by the Assyrians under Sennacherib, I believe, in 722 B.C. And now we're talking about the southern kingdom, known as Judah, escaped a similar fate only because King Hezekiah humbled himself and petitioned God for uh, deliverance. Uh, and you can, we can go back to... Uh, uh, Isaiah there, earlier chapters, it mentions Isaiah 37, and read that uh, historical thing. In case you all forgot, when we talked about it a quarter ago, Isaiah, first part, I'm sure most of us forgot it. Isaiah 37, 15 uh, would tell us that then Hezekiah, he was, he was the king there of uh, Judah, to the Lord saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the uh, seraphim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, kings of Assyria have laid waste to all the nations in their land. So they were being besieged by, by the Assyrians here. And Hezekiah, I think he's called good King Hezekiah. He's one of the few kings of the divided kingdom that re was really one of the good ones who tried to keep God's commandments. And so God put an end to things uh, right there. And so we see that who do we turn to? I think we have a tendency as humans to turn to God when we're in trouble, do we not? I think we all do it. I mean, we got people who are seriously ill. We go to God. Well, we got some tragedy in our life. We go to God. Please help us. But we need to be uh, have that type of attitude all the time, right? Not just uh, when things are not going well. We need to be aware of God and His blessings when things are going well for us, and thank God for it. And so it's just uh, I think we can't say that all this teaching here in Isaiah, you know, what does it mean to us? To me, it means that God keeps his promises, that God loves his people. He loved the people of Israel. I mean, look how many times, if I use this word, messed up, that we read about. Under the judges, well, before the judges, under the kings. I mean, it, it seemed like the people, they were on a, on a roller coaster. I mean, they would keep God's commandments, things would be well. Then they'd fall into idolatry, uh, not follow God's commandments. They'd fall into bad times. They would repent, God would forgive them, he would help them. And he's telling Judah here that I am going to help you, you know. And through, of course I didn't understand this, through Jesus Christ, all peoples of the earth, as he promised Abraham, would be blessed. Not just the Jews, that all people, Gentiles included, would be blessed eventually through uh, Jesus Christ. And so it goes on to the bottom of page uh, one there, it says... Uh, that turning to idols, and even Judah, the people, these Jews, they were worshiping idols in addition to God. They were trying to cover all the bases, so to speak. So that turning to idols or foreign gods for help was both unnecessary and fruitless. fruitless. It was a waste of time. Nevertheless, Judah did not learn this lesson. I mean, and so we see in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah all the stuff they were going through and how God condemned this kind of uh, behavior. And so we've already mentioned here on top of page 2 about Cyrus here. Matter of fact, if we read ahead of our lesson to uh, chapter 44 of Isaiah, turn to Isaiah 44. 
and uh, verse uh, 28, we'll find out that Cyrus is mentioned by name, specific name. He's not just referred to as someone that, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my, talking about God, my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. And you can go to, go to uh, Ezra 6 and read about that, that this is going to happen. And it did. Very prophetic. So if people say, you know, the, the Bible, you know, why do you believe it? Here, here's a proof text. That's a proof text. That's one proof text. That God has kept his promise. Talk about something that's going to happen in the future. And it goes on to mention uh, that uh, God's omniscience and sovereignty, uh, Cyrus eventually made provisions for the people of Judah to return from Babylonian captivity. And you can read that in Ezra 1, 1 through 4, uh, etc. So, uh, I don't know about you, but, but this is going to be really impressive, is it not? That this prophecy here in Isaiah, it came true. And if we, it, later on, when we get into Isaiah 53, we'll see that that Christ would come. And I think this was written six, some 600 years before Christ came. There's going to be a prophecy about the coming of Christ hundreds of years before it happened. And it happened. So how can we not give credibility uh, to the uh, teaching here? Uh, comments so far. I know these things are kind of tough, but <laughs> Bob... They didn't have knowledge. It does. Time and effort. Well, how do we get this knowledge? I mean, how do we get this knowledge that we know that we are on the right path? How are we going to How are we going to know we're on the right path? Huh? Study the scripture. Believe me, there's a lot of folks who claim to be religious that don't have any idea about some of the things taught in the scripture. They can't show you. Uh, they can make comments about what they feel and what they believe or what someone has told them, uh, but can they go and find it in the Scripture? And that's where knowledge is so important. I mean, if we want wisdom, then you're going to have to have knowledge to develop that wisdom. Uh, it's not just going to come to us, and uh, it's not going to come as a little, little voice in the night, the Holy Spirit that we're going to talk about Wednesday night. Don't miss it. <laughs> uh, is uh, something some people think, you know, I'm guided by the Holy Spirit. And he comes to me and he tells me stuff and I do it outside of God's word. I don't want to get ahead of myself there. But at any rate. Huh? Uh, Commentary. Yeah. I have a whole set, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good commentaries. Now, commentaries are men's opinion. And you should read several. But they always, the good ones are going to back it up with scripture. They're going to back it up with reasoning, uh, with knowledge, uh, which hopefully ends up in wisdom. And there's a lot of good commentaries even written by people, you know, outside of the Lord's church, you know, like Clark's commentary. I don't believe everything he says, but he is, he's a really good commentary. So you have to be able to rightly divide these things, you know, uh, that are taught and said. And so uh, you're right. But you know... Uh, I hate to admit this, but you know, studying the Bible, you know, it's a lot of hard work. I'll just go ahead and admit it to you. It is for me. I mean, it's, it's just not going to fall on us, you know. And you're not going to get it just by occasionally listening to a sermon or something like that. You're really going to have to. And that's why I appreciate you folks so much, not for my benefit, but for years, is that by talking about these things, discussing these things, and reasoning together, we can come uh, to the knowledge of the truth. And that's what we're trying to do t- today. Brother Tom. One of the major uh, religions in the world 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. By who? You know about Muhammad? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a lot of uh, scriptures in the New Testament that make reference. So you remember that Paul's letters to, to, to Timothy? He keeps warning him and warning him. Saying that times will come that men will have itching ears and they want to hear things that they like to hear. Makes them feel good. And there are references into, to individuals uh, forbidding, uh, forbidding, forbidding, forbidding marriage, uh, forbidding eating certain kinds of food. And you can kind of draw the references there about certain religious groups who, who teach that. And uh, if you get into the study of Revelation, and the end of uh, Daniel and Ezekiel, there are strong references to the falling away and who these individuals are. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a deep, deep study. I don't know if we'll ever get there or not uh, in Joel's lessons or not because it's, it's hard stuff to tackle. But that refers to these religious groups that will fall away. And that's one of the major religions of the world. You take that religion and you take Islam and put the two together, you're talking about over half the world's population that believe those things. False doctrine. Their people are sucked into it. And it's... Uh, oh, yeah. They were already doing it, Bob. Here, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, they were already drifting away. And here, God is talking to these coastal people, these Gentiles. Let's have a reason in here. You believe in these idols, and we're going to get to that, matter of fact, right now. Go back to chapter 41. That's our lesson here anyway. So we talked about uh, there. Uh, let's look at verses 5 through uh, 7 in uh, chapter 41. The coastlands saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid. They drew near and came. Everyone helped his neighbor and said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith who smooths with a hammer, inspired him who strikes the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. I didn't know they had solder back then. So they're putting together what? A gold or metallic precious metal idol. And he says, then he fastened it, and here's, here's the part, it's really humorous. He fastened it with pegs that it might not fall over. So here's this image that they're building, and they're going to worship it, but yet he had to prop it up because it might fall over on the floor. Ooh, boy, God, look at this, man, this idol. We're going to pray to this idol. He's going to do all this stuff for us, these idols. And yet we've got to prop it up with pegs. They're talking about props so the thing wouldn't totter over and fall over in the ground. Well, wouldn't that be awful? Our idol fell over in the ground. And so people were worshiping these things. And in some cases, they were worshiping the so-called one God also. They were, they, they were just trying to cover all the bases. And what can this God idol do for them? Now, here's the question. We're talking about idols. Everyone in this room can say, well, we don't believe in idols. We don't worship idols. But do you and I have idols today? Can you and I have idols today? And if so, what can idols be today? What kind of idols can you and I have today? Name, name one, huh? Materialism. Materialism, which covers a lot of stuff, right? Materialism. How about the quest for education, maybe, and knowledge uh, in a certain field? Nothing wrong with that in itself, but can it be so all-encompassing that it just leads our lives? And that's what we look to, is, is this knowledge that we think we've acquired through reasoning, you know, uh, we accept and believe certain things. So you and I can have idols. It could be our job. It could be possessions. It could be maybe someone in our family. Uh, it maybe could be some person, political person, or some person you look to, and we say, well, whatever he says is all knowledge. It's all truth. And we can get drawn off 
and, and divert it away from God because, you know, things are going pretty well. You know, you, you got money, you got a house, and you got... Yeah, Brother Robert. Yeah, really be any, priority any priority we put above God, Robert says. Any priority in our life that puts us God in down the line. It can be, be God is, is relegated to a lower position. Anything. And it's easy to get caught up in it, isn't it? You can get so caught up in things, involved in things, and they're not necessarily wrong things within themselves, but we can get so involved with in it that we don't have time for God. We don't have time for worship. We don't have time for Bible study. We just don't have time for it. I'm just a busy, busy person. I'm a good person, but I'm busy. Don't have time for it. Everything's going to be okay because I believe in Jesus. Yes, Bob. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. It really is. You know, and I'm not trying to say this to make people feel bad because I've done it. I'll go ahead and confess right now. I've allowed things in my life, particularly when you're, like Bob says, you're getting started and, and you're trying to establish yourself maybe in a career or you're trying to establish yourself getting a house and, and, and get involved with your family and your kids and all their activities and all their ball playing and, and all the stuff that children are involved in. Not wrong within themselves, but I mean, we can really get diverted easily. And it's very difficult, Bob says, for young families. I admit it, it really is. It, it's difficult. So I'm not being, you know, over critical of anyone. I'm just saying that, you know, you and I, if we're not careful, we can lose our priorities. And it's easy. And perhaps most of us here may have done that in the past. Maybe we're doing it right now. For, I mean, we have to self-examine ourselves and to see where we are. Uh, let's see here, where were we? Okay, uh... I already mentioned about Cyrus being mentioned in chapter 44 of Isaiah by name. And we talked about the idols and they had to be uh, made sturdy so they wouldn't fall over. Uh, in the middle of uh, page 4, it says, uh, and this is a commentary person who he says, Alan Harmon explained the idea that nations are vainly using idols to give them support even though they themselves are the work of man's hands. Now, they know that some man made this thing, but yet they're trying to worship it. No deliverance will be available to them for such human efforts. And their folly is highlighted by the final clause of the, of the verse. The idols are so precariously positioned that even they needed nails or pens to keep them from falling over. No help could ever be expected from false gods. And we've already talked about today, some of the idols of today that we think is going to bring us happiness. And, boy, I got this nice new this or that, and first day somebody runs into it and wrecks it. You know, or this beautiful whatever it is, car, boat, or something, anything. And it, we find out it's just a material thing and uh, that we think is going to bring us happiness. And I think most of us get involved in these things because we think it's going to bring fulfillment and happiness in our lives. If we just get this thing or accomplish this thing, we're going to be happy, we're going to be fulfilled. And a lot of people who are the least fulfilled are people who have, have had great success uh, in business world or in academic world. Great success, but they feel somehow unfulfilled. It could be that that individual lacks God in their life. Uh, they, they lack that focus on what really matters. And I know it's difficult, because, but you... And, Unless the Lord allows us, and of course, to live, to be older, it's just hard to grasp these things. You know, it's hard to sit here for an older man to tell people in their 30s and 40s and 50s, you know, that uh, you don't need to be involved in these things because it's very difficult. And it's, so we need to pray about it, but, and we need to study and stay in God's Word because I think faith, our faith, will never increase as we go along in life unless we are involved in God's Word and involved in worship, involved in fellowship. And that's why the elders are always encouraging people to try to come at all possible to the assemblies because we need that encouragement. 
I can't tell you how much you guys encourage me. I mean, I, I do. I, I see you and I feel, well, you know, I, you know, I have a family here on earth. You know, I have a spiritual family that really loves the Lord, that really cares about what goes on day to day, and that we all have a summer goal to please God and, and be with Him for eternity someday. You know, we need that encouragement and that help. So we need to uh, be aware of that. Uh, let's see here. Where were I? Uh, I already mentioned that. There at the bottom of, uh, we were talking about uh, Abraham coming out of Ur of Chaldees. There at the bottom of page uh, five, uh, it mentions, uh, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I believe that's just, just as accurate today as it was uh, in Abraham's day or in Isaiah's day. It says at the top of page 6 that God promises to strengthen his people, then bolster by his willingness to protect them from their enemies. Through his provisions, the enemies of Judah would be ashamed and disgraced. And sure enough, Judah would persevere. After all, Jerusalem is in, is in Judea, is it not? Did not Christ make his appearance there? Was not his death and resurrection there in Jerusalem? And it says here uh, in the middle of the page, and I've already mentioned this, we mentioned it again, I have it underlined, that God made, uh, made a promise to bless Abraham's descendants and he intended to keep it. Now it's mentioned here, kind of interesting, in verse 14, this uh, term threshing sledge with sharp teeth. And about, what are they talking about here? Uh, verse 14, it says, Fear not, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. What in the world is he talking about here? Well, there, I looked it up, and it says a threshing, threshing sledge uh, is an implement that they drag over ripe grain, and it separates the, the grain from the stalk. I guess they're talking about wheat here, are they not? You, that sound right? People who know about agriculture stuff, wheat, you had to separate the, uh, the grain from the stalk that was left behind, the stubble. And so, anyway, he's, he's using this example here that the people of Judah would be like a uh, threshing sledge. And so, he mentioned that God made promises to bless Abraham and his descendants. He intended to keep it. Because of God, Judah would be able to accomplish the seemingly impossible. Without God's help, they were a worm. But with God's help, they were a threshing sledge. So without God, they're saying you're just a bunch of worms. But with me, on your side, you're a powerful implement. And you and I, as Christians, can be a powerful implement in spreading the gospel. Thank you. I hope I hadn't caused... Confusion. I know this can be kind of a tough subject, and believe me, uh, it worried me a lot trying to pre prepare for this because I hope I didn't say anything to cause any confusion. Thank you. Appreciate it. I hope. Good morning.
It's time to begin our service, and certainly wonderful to see each of you here today and how much it means to me to see you all. And it's a beautiful day we have. Our brother Joel Danley, our minister, and his family, they're on vacation today, as most of you know, and we want to remember him, and hopefully they'll have safe travels. We're so fortunate to have two of our brothers going to be preaching with us today. Leading this morning's uh, service, Brother Charles Abels, and this afternoon, Brother Brian Cirillo will be delivering messages, and it's really wonderful to have men that can step up and preach and have that ability and share their gifts with us, so thank you to them. I want to welcome our visitors. Uh, if we have some visitors today, you are our special guests, and we look forward to having you worshiping with us at any time that you're in our area. We would like an opportunity to get to meet you. For those that cannot be here that are watching live stream, uh, we look forward to your return and some of you will be watching it later as a recording and we're just thankful that we have this opportunity. Looking at our schedule, I want to remind everybody that we do have our Bible study every Sunday morning at 9.30. Of course, our worship service begins at 10.25. We do provide a meal in between services because we come back at 1.30 for our afternoon service. And then on Wednesday night, we have our Bible classes, which begin at 7. We started a new class this morning, and uh, it's for college age folks, and uh, Brother Danley will be leading that, but since he's out today, Brother Brian filled in and kicked that off. We've got a lot of events going on, care team meetings. Uh, beginning today, care team one will meet, and I think all of these are after the 130 service. I know I'm on care team two, and that's when we meet. We'll be meeting the next Sunday, and then the following Sunday, the 19th, Care Team 3 will meet. And I'd just like to encourage everybody to be a part of the team. Uh, there's a lot of good work going on. If you look at our prayer list and our shut-in list and our bulletin, it's, it continues to grow, and a lot of our Care Team work uh, addresses a little outreach program to try to keep people informed to invite new people moving into the community, into our church. So we hope everybody will support that. Men's Devo is tomorrow night, and every time I get a chance, I like to promote that. It'll be at 7 p.m. here in the fellowship room. Uh, it's just really uplifting to have a group of men trying to be better Christians, talking about different ways that we can be better and uh, this is about the seventh or eighth month I've been in attendance once I came I've not missed it's very important and uh, it really helps me spiritually the ladies Devo will be Tuesday the 14th at 630 and I know that's the same case with the ladies We've got an extensive sick list, and unfortunately, yours truly is on there. I wish it was just a rotator cuff. I'll be having a full shoulder replacement with rotator cuff repairment and some other things going on there. And I've got about a week and a half I'll be going in for that. And I certainly would appreciate your prayers. We have two of our sisters having eye surgery this week, Nancy Morris. And Betty Parton face Gray's aunt. We're both scheduled for their surgeries this week. Nina Templeton, we want to remember that sweet lady. She suffered a, a, a fall recently. Chris Stennett's having back problems. Dottie Dixon, which is Janice Ritchie's mother. Uh, we've kept her in our prayers, and she's in rehab in Knoxville. Jackson Burke, Gary Morris' nephew, is in Cincinnati Hospital needing our prayers. Don Lane, Francis Everett's brother-in-law, had a reaction to his heart medicine. He's at home now. 
We need to keep him and his wife Connie in our prayers. Carol Lassiter, a member of Northampton County, uh, Church of Christ, had a heart attack last week. And Bruce Williams, a friend of James and Bobby Reevely, has been diagnosed with cancer. Like I said, please look over our shut-in list, our prayer list. Uh, those people need to hear from us, and I know it does them a lot of good. We have some sympathy to recognize. First of all, uh, Lloyd Houston, which is the uncle of Corey Cirillo, uh, passed away. We want to remember Corey and her family at this time. The family of Randy Sims, a friend of Charles Abel's, he also passed away. Uh, most of you probably heard of the really bad accident for the South Pittsburgh uh, folks. I think they were four young men killed, highly thought of in that community. As one survivor, Eli Joyner, I know he's in critical condition, but he's the cousin of Tanner Pickett. And uh, we just really want to pray for Eli's recovery. We want to pray for Tana, Tanner and Jessica as they go through this hard time. Giovanni Kelly, 22-year-old brother of Corey Gray's friend Ryan, was killed in a motorcycle accident in Alabama yesterday. And prayers for Ryan and his family are requested. And I also learned that Carla Harrison's not here today. Her husband, Tony, has COVID. So we got a lot of people to remember in our prayers. And uh, I'd just like to say, you know, we had another shooting this morning. I don't know if you guys got word of that. A multiple shooting down somewhere around Macaulay Avenue. This is on top of the recent shooting that involved some of our Hickson High School students. The nation's covered up with these kind of events. And uh, I just feel like coming to Bible study, supporting your care team, doing things, the little things. You know, as we study the Old Testament, we see how God's children eroded from the inside and fell away. But there's always a remnant that God blessed. And I feel like we're that remnant. And it's going to take these little things that we sometimes don't realize to stay faithful. There's a lot of Christians in the world, people that believe in Christ, but we use the term New Testament Christians going strictly by the Scripture. And that takes a lot of study. And I get so much out of our... Sunday morning or Wednesday night Bible study and I want to encourage everybody to let's give it our all, let's be here let's, let's not let the Lord down let's go to God in prayer Father we're so blessed to have a beautiful day that we can come worship in comfort knowing that we've got brothers and sisters that love the Lord that support us, that want to do everything they can to always please you. Father, we pray that all things done today will please you, that we will glorify your name, and we look forward to hearing from Brother Charles and Brother Brian. We thank you for them and their abilities. We pray for all those that we've mentioned that are sick, that are needing sympathy. We pray for the Danley family, that they'll Enjoy themselves, have a good return home to us. And thank you for the eldership we have that looks over us, that makes sure that we are, we are New Testament Christians, Father, and we worship in an appropriate way. Thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. morning. Our first song is number 291, 291. I would like to give an additional plug for our uh, men's Devo that is on the first Monday night of every month. 
uh, tomorrow as a definite treat. Uh, one of our elders, Brother Bob Smith, is uh, leading us in a study about encouragement and being an encourager. And if any of you know Bob Smith, you know that is a perfect topic for him. He is definitely an encourager. He's an encourager to me, and I know he is to you, and that'll be a great study. So please join us uh, in that. Number 291, we'll sing all four verses. <clears throat> I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and have persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the word creating faith in him. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me. Of weary ways or golden days, <clears throat> his face I see. But I know whom I have believed and have persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. Number 359, 359 before our Lord's Supper. 359. <clears throat> Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the Found me that 
Does everyone have a packet? If you don't, please raise your hand and, and we will get you one. Chase. <clears throat> Anyone else? Lord's Supper, we do this in remembrance of Jesus. We're all human, and we all tend to forget things. But God knew this, so when he sent his son to die the terrible death on the cross for us, he wanted to make sure that we never forget this great sacrifice, that Christ shed his blood on the cross so that we can have forgiveness of our sins. In 1 Peter 1, Verses 18 and 19, we read, For as much as ye know that they were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Christ himself instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Christ instituted the Lord's Supper while he was with his disciples. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Christ wanted us to remember 
his sufferings. We know Christ desired to be remembered, for Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 25, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Twice in these verses, he has told us to do this in remembrance of me. How often do we partake of this memorial feast? And we find that in Acts 20 and verse 7. The early disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. So it's very important that we partake of this memorial on the first day of each and every week. Also, the Lord's Supper must be observed reverently. We read in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28 and 29, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we must focus also on redemption. It is a joy and a comfort to a sinner who is outside the body of Christ to realize that it makes no difference how many sins they have committed or how bad a lifestyle they have lived. The blood of Christ can wash away their sins. Isaiah 1 and 18 reads, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be crimson, they shall be as wool. We also should observe the gratitude of Christ. For every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remember all the suffering he did for us. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's have a prayer for the bread. Our Father, who art in heaven, we are thankful for your sacrifice that you made on the cross for us. Father, as we partake of this unleavened bread, our minds reflect back to that old rugged cross and to the suffering and shame that took place to our Lord and Savior. And for everything that he endured, Father, we ask your blessings on this bread that represents his body. And Father, we pray that we can partake of this in a manner that be acceptable to you. This is our prayer through Christ Jesus. Amen. give thanks for the cup <clears throat> our father in heaven as we take this cup in remembrance of Jesus we visualize the piercing of Jesus body and the blood and the water that flowed freely father we are thankful to you that now through baptism our sins are washed away father we ask your blessings on this cup this fruit of the vine that represents that blood Father, may we always remember what Jesus done for each of us. This is our prayer, in and through Christ Jesus. Amen. As a separate part of our worship, giving of our means, which we do most of the time as we enter, and the collection plate is always available if you want to give your means as you exit the building also, <clears throat> till it remains in the foyer for that. Second Corinthians 9 verse 7 reads, Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Let's pray for the offering. 
Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this great country, for this great community that we live in, and for all the opportunities available to us to go out and earn a living in support of our families, and along with giving our means in support of spreading the gospel throughout the world. Father, at this time, we pray that each of us have given with happy hearts and that our eldership can use this money in a way that will be acceptable for your will. This is our prayer through Christ Jesus. Amen. For our prayer number 237, 237, we'll sing both verses. <clears throat> Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sin from the Father and it thrills my soul. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, the ruler of all nature, all-knowing, all-powerful Father, it is our desire this morning to bring honor and praise to you, Father, thanking you that your grace has been extended to us, Father, and we're so thankful that you are our Father, that you are in control because 
Father, I'll admit this morning, I don't know quite where to really to begin with uh, all the events of tragedy that has occurred in our community here and also in other places. Father, our hearts are uh, overwhelmed with the enormity of the evil that's taking place in our society here in our country, that we need Thee, Father, more than ever before to help us to stay focused on you, Father. We know that you are in control. We as humans question why things happen the way they do, Father, and our hearts and prayers are extended to the family of the youth from South Pittsburgh that were tragically killed, and for young Eli as he struggles with his injuries. Father, our Hearts are touched by the events in Uvalde, Texas that took place and the loss of so much young, so many young lives and teachers and just the families that are touched and they're so overwhelmed this day that it's hard for us to know what to think or what to do. And we question what are people really thinking in our society today. We know that they're not looking to you, Father, and they're not looking to your word and to your wisdom to guide us in our lives. And we just hope that when the opportunities present themselves, Father, that we can encourage these folks in any way, especially those that we know the families of, the personal involvement there, that we can offer encouragement to them. That we know that you have the power to touch lives, Father, and we hope that some form of comfort can be brought to, to all these families involved in all these tragedies. Father, we are so thankful that you have blessed us with families, with shelter, with food, and all the necessities of life. But more importantly, Father, you have uh, blessed us with the hope of, of eternal life with you, Father, and that going forward, we need to keep our eye uh, on the goal of this and to remain faithful to study your word, to grow in faith, Father. We're also aware of, uh, we have so many that are sick that I fear that I will forget people's names and do not mean any disrespect of any families that I fail to mention, but I'll try to mention the families that we have already mentioned uh, in our announcements, Father. Uh, you know, our Robert Smith is facing surgery and I know he's concerned about that, and those of us who've had that type of surgery, we realize what he's going through, and we just pray for the very best outcome in his surgery. Uh, we pray for Nancy Morris, and that her eye surgery will go well, for Nina Templeton, that she will recuperate from her fall, from a Chris Stennett, that he'll have uh, relief from his back problems, Betty Parton, face Grace Ant, who will have eye surgery Wednesday, we pray for good results there. For Dottie Dixon, uh, Janice Ritchie's mother, who is in rehab in Knoxville, that she will have uh, some good results there. For Jackson Burke, uh, Gary Morris's nephew in the hospital in Cincinnati, a children's hospital with a serious pancreas problem, that they can find some uh, resolution to his issue, Father. For Don Lane, Francis Everett's brother-in-law, that he'll uh, have a better results from his medication. For Carol Lasseter, a member of North Hamilton who has recently had a heart attack, that you will be able to recuperate from this event. Bruce Williams, a friend of James and uh, Bobby Reveley, who's been diagnosed with cancer, that he can have good results from treatment. Father, we are reminded of our shut-ins that it's so easy to put aside and forget, or Sally Breyer, Yuvine Birdeye, Frankie Cox, Samira Ferry, Christine Marlowe, Betty Meredith, Betty Smith and Tracy Smitherman, that we can continue to remember these individuals and to visit them, pray for them. Father, we're also uh, sympathetic to uh, the loss of life uh, for Corey Sorello and the passing of her uncle, and for the uh, family of Randy Sims, a friend of Charles Abel, who passed away recently. We know these uh, are so much uh, sickness and heartache, Father, in the, in the world going on, and we pray for those who are suffering uh, depression, loneliness, anxiety uh, as a result of these activities or just a result of everyday issues that they can uh, look to thee, Father, and 
hopefully uh, have some better results going forward. We want to continue to remember uh, those in the Ukraine or involved in this terrible war with Russia, especially those who are a member of your family, your church, that they will be protected from harm. Father, we, we pray for the work that's taking place in so many uh, parts of the world that we are involved with, uh, Nicaragua, Panama, India, Africa, other places, and locally that we can uh, spread your gospel and that uh, we know your word will not return empty and that there will be those souls that will respond to the word uh, in a positive way. Father, we also pray for those that are traveling, the Danley family, that they will be uh, free from harm and uh, injury and all those who have been traveling because we know so many have lost their life over this past holiday weekend so tragically. Father, we uh, pray for our leaders in Washington that they will look to you, Father, and quit looking to themselves and human wisdom, that they will do a better job going forward than with the issues going on in this, co in this country, that they can wake up to what's going on and try to instigate and involve in better results uh, for our society. Father, we forgive them for uh, the sins that they commit. We pray for their forgiveness uh, uh, as they go forward. We pray for us and all the sins that we know that we commit, some overtly, some secretly, some in our own minds, that we be forgiven of those sins, Father, and we pray that going forward that we can uh, be cleansed of those sins. We thank you for Jesus Christ and his blood that makes remission of sins possible. We thank you for all your blessings. We pray that you'll be with Brother Charles this morning and Brother Brian this afternoon as they uh, bring a lesson to us. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're using a songbook and would like to mark the song of encouragement at the appropriate time, number 189 will be that song, 189. Then before our lesson, number 786, 786, we'll sing all three verses. And if it's convenient for you, will you please stand? <clears throat> <clears throat> Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Taking away Matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it. Greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the Wonderful grace of Jesus. 
Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it. Greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity. And the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, Sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it. Greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Be seated, please. Good morning. It's great to see everyone this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Thank you for being part of our worship time together. We hope you're making your plans to return to us at 1.30 this afternoon for another uh, worship time together and then again on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for our midweek Bible study. As always, we have visitors among us and we're thankful for you. We invite you back and hope that you'll stick around, let us get to know you, meet you, and, 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 and know that you're always welcome here. One announcement I wanted to make um, Friend, a personal friend of mine in Shannon's, and, and those of you who've been to Nicaragua, uh, he's a member of the Eastridge Church. Randall Webb is scheduled for open heart surgery coming up in the next couple weeks, and we want to remember Randall uh, during that time. So if you could add him to your prayer list, we would much appreciate that as well. The lesson I've selected this morning um, is a new one to me. I just uh, thought of this recently and put, this, put some thoughts together. I hope you'll find benefit from it. It's not necessarily meant to be humorous, but there are some hopefully humorous points in there that help us to remember and make application of some of these things. Entitled, Declutter Your Life. If you have a, a portion on your bulletin there, if you'd like to take some notes, that'd be wonderful. If you uh, find something particularly interesting that you'd like to follow up on, if you have any questions concerning this lesson from me, be happy to discuss those as well. In this country, we have a clutter problem. I don't know how well that shows up on the screen, but that's a, a picture of someone's inside of someone's garage. I think you can, we can all somehow relate to that. We have a clutter problem in this country. Some st interesting statistics that bear this out. Almost 10% of American households rent at least one storage unit. 
Two-thirds of those who pay for storage live in a house with a garage. 52% of sto storage customers rent for more than one year. There are more than 50,000 self-storage facilities in the United States, more than McDonald's and Starbucks combined. The average storage, storage unit rents for about $100 a month. $38 billion, we're told, is spent annually in this country on storage. The median single-family home is 2,355 square feet. Incidentally, in 1950, that number was 983 square feet. 1970, it had grown to 1,500 square feet. 80% of the items that people store are never used. Retail sales of home organization products, you know, all the containers and all those kind of things, reached nearly $20 billion, that's billion with a B, last year. 54% of Americans are overwhelmed by the amount of clutter they have, but 78% say they know, have no idea what to do about it. Americans collectively spent $2.7 billion every year replacing items they can't find. Some of this gets close to home. Not only does it stress us out physically and financially, people who sleep in cluttered rooms are more likely to have sleeping problems. When in cluttered spaces, people are more likely to make poor eating choices. Those with extremely cluttered homes are 77% more likely to be overweight. If you're like me and most Americans, you have a clutter problem. This cartoon here gets kind of personal to me. I don't know if you can see it or not. It's a man, an older man and a younger man standing in front of a packed garage. It says, one day, son, all this will be yours. I think we can all relate to that. My wonderful wife recently read a book entitled Decluttering at the Speed of Life by Dana K. White. It's one of hundreds of books, I'm sure, on this particular subject that deal with the matter of clutter. After her gentle urging, I read the book as well. It was the inspiration for this letter, or this lesson. You know, as preachers and teachers, we're, often, we're always looking for new material, and I couldn't help but thinking as I was reading this book, there's a lesson in there somewhere. Up to this point, I've talked about clutter in terms of physical, material, tangible things in our life. But I would submit for our thinking that we have non-material, intangible clutter in our lives as children of God that needs to be dealt with too. That's the point of this lesson. Point number one, let's consider for a moment the why. Why do we need to address or talk about these kind of things? Just like our homes and our physical spaces, they can collect clutter, so can our hearts and minds. We can become so filled with random stuff that we lose track of what matters most. Those jam-packed closets and stuffed junk drawers seem to call out to us to organize them. All that clutter can stress us out, can it? The same process can happen in our spiritual lives. We need to deal with clutter in our lives. It needs to be dealt with, and that's the point of this lesson. Spiritual clutter is anything that comes between you and your relationship with Jesus. You know, we can build up spiritual clutter oftentimes until the only places left for God are the little nooks and crannies in between it all. Your mind can be cluttered with excessive social media, news, Netflix, or screen time. 
Also, juggling busy schedules can lead us to miss out on what God has planned for us. We can get distracted from our relationship with Jesus by getting caught up in our own wants and needs. It's easy to leave our sin habits in that stuffed junk drawer. Resentment, bitterness, pride, anger. We all have behaviors that come between us and God. What emotional clutter are you stuffing into your spiritual closet? Fear, anxiety, worry, guilt, and shame, all these things can take over your thoughts and squeeze out the joy, the peace, and contented spirit that God wants us to have. I want to stop here for just a moment and give a disclaimer. I am not in any form or fashion talking about mental conditions that are known to exist and that often require clinical remedies. I am not trained in behavioral matters or in any way qualified to dis discuss these issues. I am aware that they exist. Many people we know and love struggle with those things. I would encourage anyone suffering from mental illness to seek proper care. I'm going to give a plug here real quickly for the Greater Chattanooga Christian Counseling or Christian Center. A friend of ours, Steve Grubb, just recently took over the helm of that organization. We support here from our treasury. Uh, send them monthly um, a contribution for their services. Very good Christian counseling services for those of you who are familiar with that or may need that in the future. Please reach out to them, and I know you'll be able to get some help there. I am talking, though, about clutter that may be keeping you from seeing and experiencing God's power to work in your life. Point number two, letting go of everything that we do not need. Baggage, guilt, bad decisions, regret, worry, fear. It's true that our past is part of who we are, but it doesn't have to be our future. I heard a preacher say a number of years ago something that stuck with me. He said, your past can be your monster or your mission. Your monster or your mission. We are in control of how we deal with that. God expects us to learn from our past and, and use those lessons to help others. I can't help but not think about the Apostle Paul back when he was Saul of Tarsus. The Bible records some of the evil things that he did, engaged in, persecuting the church, persecuting Christians, consenting to their death. We see him there first in Acts, early chapters of Acts when he was holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. You know, I, I would be willing to venture to say that there was not a day in Paul's life after, that, after he became a Christian, he learned the truth, that he didn't think about those things. We're just human, aren't we? We can't oftentimes forget our past and things that we've done in the past, but yet we can know that we're forgiven of those things and we can move forward not letting those things handicap us, not letting those things define us, but using those things to learn and to teach other people. If fear, hatred, anger, anxiety, unbelief, rejection, etc. are all things that fill your life, where is there room for God and His promises for your future? John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus is talking about their contrast between Himself and the devil. And He talks about how the devil wants to destroy. He wants to tear down. He wants to... Uh, do all the things that are against us. But in contrast, Jesus says, John 10, 10 says, I came so that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. He's not talking about physical blessings necessarily. He's talking about quality of life, life that we can enjoy, life that we can be successful in living and working and serving him. That's the offer that he makes to us that abundant life that we can all as Christians have. You know, God is about newness, starting fresh in His mercy and grace. I appreciate Brian singing those songs this morning about grace. We didn't have that planned, incidentally, but it worked out well. You can't reach for anything new 
if your hands are still full of yesterday's junk, you have to let it go. I'm reminded of what the Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Set aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares or besets us. Those things that would seek to, to get us off course. Those things that would keep our eye off the goal of serving God. Let those things go. Let's get to the practical part of our lesson. Let's talk for a moment about the how. We talked about the why. Let's talk about the how. Some practical steps for decluttering your spiritual life. Study God's Word and pray is number one. Include God in the process. You know, I think this would solve a lot of our problems, wouldn't it? If we would read God's Word more, study God's Word and pray. Look at Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. This is a familiar passage, one of my favorite passages. You know, the, the Philippian letter from, inspired from Paul is what we oftentimes call the love letter to the church. But he gives us some things here that we can apply in our lives, some practical things that will help us. Verse 6, beginning, Ephesians, or excuse me, Philippians 4, verse 6. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. We've talked about this before. That word guard there is a military term. Think about those in the military who have guard duty, standing guard while others sleep. They're watching. Same idea there. Verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are lovely, things that are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. Verse 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. That's Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9. So we, the, the point number one under the how is to study God's word and pray. Point number two, Get rid of the trash. This is step one in Dana White's book, by, by the way, that we talked about. And if we're being honest with ourselves, this is the most glaring and obvious place to start. That involves oftentimes getting or stopping the negative self-talk. You ever negative self-talk yourself? I think we've all tried that from time to time. Stop comparing yourself with others. You know, social media has given us this avenue or this venue the where we can compare ourselves with everybody. And you know something? Most of the time, we're going to come up short because people are not always truthful in those, in those environments. So stop comparing yourself to others. Thirdly, under getting rid of the trash, stop holding a grudge or ill will against a brother or sister. Those things, nothing good comes out of grudges. We shouldn't keep those things point number three in how the how practical steps for decluttering your spiritual life unpack your clutter you know in, in when we get ready to declutter a space in our home we have to drag out all the stuff and lay it out we have to decide what spiritual closet you want to declutter and sort through it all ask yourself these questions what activity or practice feeds your spiritual growth and what distracts you from living the life God has prescribed for you bringing God the glory should be our motivation in all that we choose to, to or not to do take your time it's a process if you get sidelined trying to declutter your life today press pause start again tomorrow it's a process Fourthly, organize the good stuff. Back to point number one under the how, reading and studying and praying. Let God's word help guide you to determine what the good stuff is. Decide what needs to be priority in your spiritual life. 
incorporate those things back into your life thoughtfully and prayerfully. Don't know if you can tell by this picture or not. This is that garage that we looked at earlier in a cluttered state, in an organized state or a decluttered state. I don't know about you, but when I've taken the effort to declutter a space in or around my home, doesn't it make you feel a lot better about that situation? Doesn't it make you glad that you took the effort to declutter? We'll all admit that those that have, who have tried it, the process may take some time and hard work. But I, after it's over, I, I so much more appreciate being able to find what I want to find. I'm not spending my life looking for something there. I feel less stressed and more organized. I find I have more time to, for what's important in life. Likewise, decluttering your spiritual life has some awesome benefits as well. When you clean out the unforgiveness, the impatience, the anxiety and worry, you are not only more available to his plans, but you are strengthened by his peace. Hoarding old sinful habits keep us from growing in our faith. We weren't made to live in the guilt and frustration of sin. God doesn't want us to live that way. He has given us everything in his power that we don't have to do that. Decluttering means less space for negative thoughts, that pesky emotional baggage, and behaviors. You can focus on your unique God-given image, talents, and strength as he leads. God wants us to be contented and satisfied and live satisfied lives. When we declutter our spiritual life, we can fully focus on him. As we bring this lesson to a close, I hope, again, some of these practical thoughts resonate with you. Maybe there's something in there that you can take and use in your life this week. Maybe there's some clutter that's keeping you from being all that you can be in service to God and to your fellow man. We always take this opportunity when we're together, knowing that there's a, this group of this size, maybe a spiritual need here that people can avail themselves of. It all starts with being a Christian. God's word has not left us alone in regard to that. He gives us all that we need that pertains to those things. Hear the word of God. Believe the word. Repent. Confess. Be baptized for the remission of sins. Christ will add you to his church. You can begin on that path to heaven. Wash free of your sins through the blood of Christ. Looking forward to eternity in heaven with him. It could be that you're here as a Christian. Maybe you've allowed sin to clutter your life. If that's public in nature, it needs to be dealt with that way. Pray for to that God will forgive you and confess those things. He's faithful and just to do just that. Also, as a Christian, there's a way that God expects us to live. Revelation 2.10, Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Are you promoting faithful living in your life? Are you an example to others that you come in contact with? I, I pray that you are. If you need the strength of this congregation, if it's anything you need in becoming a Christian or to be restored to that relationship with him, would you come as we stand, as we sing? Of our loving Lord.
Death's grace untold. Point to the refuge, the mighty cross. Marvelous grace, infinite grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Marvelous grace, infinite grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Marvelous grace, infinite grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Marvelous grace, infinite grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who will leave you that are longing to see his face. Will you this moment his grace receive? Marvelous grace, infinite grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Marvelous grace, infinite grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Amen. I need to make an announcement tonight. I won't take too long of your time, but I want to do this before we dismiss. It is an important announcement. This morning, the elders of the Saudi Church of Christ would like to take this opportunity to thank each member of this congregation for your support as we continue to be guided by God's word. And we also ask you uh, to keep doing the work that you do we're so thankful for this being a working congregation. Uh, this always helps everyone. It especially helps the deacons and elders' job, everybody doing their part. We continue to be thankful for the peace and the harmony and especially the love which are so present among the members of the Saudi Church. And we want you to know that it will always be our desire that God's will will be carried out in this congregation. Now, we are thankful that we're growing. We're thankful that a lot have come back since the COVID. And uh, because of this, we see a need for additional help in serving the members of this congregation. Uh, so this is why we are putting the name of our brother Ricky Richie forward today to serve as one of our deacons for this congregation. We are confident that Ricky is well qualified to serve as a deacon here, and we feel that he will be able to carry out the responsibilities of this office according to God's will. Ricky has a wonderful family. He loves this church. He's told me about this and how much he's glad to be back in Saudi. Uh, when his wife was teaching in Pikeville, they attended Bethel. But anyway, his heart is here, and we're thankful for that. Uh, now, if any member of the Saudi congregation knows of any reason why Ricky is not qualified, according to the scriptures found in 1 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 8 through 12, we do ask you to please submit these reasons to the elders in writing by Wednesday, June the 15th, because it is our plan to appoint Ricky 
as a deacon on June the 19th at our morning service. And folks, we ask you to please pray for Ricky as he enters into this great work. It's a great opportunity to serve the Lord. We also ask you to continue to pray for your elders as we make decisions like this from time to time. Uh, this morning, I know I speak for the rest of the elders, but uh, I want to take this opportunity to personally thank the men who are now serving as elders. I really don't think we could do without them. <laughs> they do so much. Uh, you know, we're, we're blessed here at Saudi. We have a great facility to worship in. It's, it's paid for, but there's so many things going on. Uh, the deacons help us with, you know, we have air conditioning, the banks to be mowed and took care of, and the shrubbery to be taken care of. So they do so many things that we just take for granted, and they make our job a lot easier by serving like they do. So we are thankful for our deacons, and, and we need to let them know that regularly. Uh, now, we are growing, and we're thankful for this. And uh, But by us growing, we know that there will be a need for more men to serve as elders and deacons in the future. So let me encourage all the young people that be make setting a goal that you want to serve the Lord in the best way that you can. And, and this is the best way I know we can serve. So in closing today, I, I would like to ask all to continue to work together for the good of the Lord's church here, Saudi. And uh, may God continue to bless each one of us as we work together to do his will. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Number three, I'm sorry, number 500. Number 500 will be our closing prayer. I was going to say that... Um, Charlie went from preaching to meddling this morning. Um, you've seen my garage, haven't you, Charlie? I say I have a two-car storage building at my house. So it is a work in progress. Number 500 and then our closing prayer. Oh, the fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never seeking, calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed with precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee Never let me wander from thee, never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy core.
courts above. I want to thank Charles for the lesson today that helps me to recognize some of the clutter in my life, even though I'm a perfectionist in life, but we all have clutter that goes on in our spiritual way. Please pray with me. Oh, dear Holy Father, thank you for blessing us with this wonderful day of life, and thank you for allowing us to be here today, and we know that there's a reason for us being here today, or we wouldn't be here, Father. I just thank you for everything in life, thank you for our health, and thank you for just our, the love that we have for one and the other, the love for families, and and uh, just be able to go into the world and see the beauty of your creation and breathe the fresh air, Father, and help us to uh, try to separate the worldly things today that that causes us to uh, steer away with, if we get caught up in, in all these things that goes on, Father. And I just pray for the ones that's mentioned today, and, and I also pray, Father, for the ones that's not mentioned that that we don't know about that's uh, struggling out here in life, Father, that doesn't know you and uh, that uh, has, that are struggling severely, Father, in this time of our, our crisis that's going on, Father, in our world with our cost of things and just our everyday living, Father, and we know that there are people struggling and, and I just pray, Father, that you'll be with them and comfort them and strengthen them as uh, you do us, Father. I just pray that you'll be with us and continue to guide us, Father, and please forgive us for our sinful ways of life. In Jesus' holy name, amen.